you name it. And yeah, we're looking forward to hearing your all of our Great. So uh, thank you much for, uh, very much for that uh, nice, nice introduction. Uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me here to speak uh, on, on this topic, one which is uh, dear, dear to my hearts, which is scattering amplitudes. So I think this talk will, will probably be a little bit of a change of gear relative to what you've uh, been seeing. Uh, from what I saw, there have been a lot of phenomenal, very interesting lectures on all kinds of aspects of what could broadly be called kind of beyond the standard model physics, things that are nominally in the standard model in general relativity, but nevertheless have good reasons uh, 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 to, 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 to exist and for which we should look in experiments to see if they do exist. Uh, this is gonna be kind of a, a different perspective, okay? I've, I've myself personally have worked, of course, on, on BSM, things like, uh, 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 like inflation or dark matter or, or model building of sorts, but it's a very different kind of game, okay? So the way I would describe it, maybe as we kind of ease into things here right at the start, is that I think kind of model building and the thinking about beyond the standard model physics is, is kind of like trying to construct something very elegant that explains as many things as possible and dodges the bullets that are other experiments, okay? So in some sense, it uh, requires great creativity, requires knowing what constrains you and knowing how to do it elegantly. Amplitudes is more about kind of introspectively staring at things that we already knew in some sense from a different angle and hopefully learning something different about it, okay? So in some sense, if you, if you like, I'm just telling you at the front here, we're not gonna be asking about new hypothetical things. We're gonna be studying the standard model, gauge theories, gravity. And I wanna argue and hopefully convince you of in the next couple lectures that there's actually new things that you can learn by studying them and thinking about them in maybe a different, uh, uh, a different angle from which you're maybe usually accustomed. Now, you might ask, what could you possibly know or learn about a theory when we already know the Lagrangian, right? So as usual, whenever we define a theory, typically, in the language of phenomenology or beyond the standard model phenomenology, we just write down an action, okay, some integral, say in some number of dimensions of a, a Lagrangian, L of X, and this is everything. Once someone's written this down, we would claim victory, and something like a scattering amplitude, a cross-section, a correlator, free energy, all these things are things you compute afterwards maybe to check against an experiment, okay? But the important thing was already this action that you wrote down. That's the usual perspective. But uh, hopefully you know that's a little bit misleading. It's misleading because the action isn't the thing we actually start with. The thing we start with is the physics principles that dictated this action. So in particular, in the standard model, say, we, dic we, we, we stipulate that there exists some set of degrees of freedom, of some spins, masses, and so on. We define some set of symmetries which allow them to interact, and then we write down the most general possible object that conforms to those principles, okay? Now, everything that isn't fixed by a principle, okay, is a parameter, okay? So the things that we think of as the 19 free parameters of the standard model, those are all the things that can take on different values in principle because the principles didn't fix them, uh, and then we measure them in experiments, okay? So that's, that's the notion of the separation between uh, 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 what's really in the theory and the free parameters of the theory. Um, now, uh, there's lots of different principles that I'll talk about in this, in this class uh, or in this, in this set of lectures. Okay, this is principles. But the uh, kind of upshot of the S matrix, scattering matrix amplitudes program is to realize that we don't have to go through this, uh, this uh, action to get to something like the amplitude, for instance which will be kind of my nominal observable in this class, we can go directly from the principles directly to the amplitude. Okay, I continue, continually draw this picture, but this is the ultimate kind of story of the S matrix bootstrap all the way back to like the 70s, which was the old lineage of this, which is to start uh, from principles and think of the space of functions that your amplitude could be, and then uh, enforce those constraints and see what pops out. Okay. And uh, kind of the first maybe half of what I'll talk about in my set of lectures is kind of old things that you know, okay? Like re re realizing the world is described by gauge theories, uh, uh, understanding the structure of theories, that'll all follow uh, relatively straightforwardly by fixing the principles first. Those principles will be things like Lorentz invariance, locality, factorization, re relatively modest physical principles. But the whole point of this, at least in my view, is more than that. It's not just about like learning how to do something with fewer tools for no reason. You can actually learn that there exist hidden latent structures inside the old classic theories, okay? And that's gonna be hopefully the bulk of what I can get to in, 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 in my lectures. We can learn new facts. This includes facts about general relativity, facts about QCD, Yang-Mills theory, the chiral Lagrangian, and connections between them. 
okay? Uh, I'll kind of get to that in a second in, in detail. Um, but um, the point here is that we can learn new things. And my, my kind of path here is that I'm gonna introduce those new structures as they come, first within the guise of amplitudes, but then when I can, give a QFT understanding of those structures. So this kind of goes both ways. To me, amplitudes is a tool. You can use it to figure out things. Once you know the thing is there, you don't need to use amplitudes if you don't want to. You can use any means necessary to try to figure out what's going on. So it's yet another tool in that respect. So that's kind of the broad brush picture. Let me uh, start by just uh, maybe uh, motivating a little bit more why you'd ever want to skip the step. Okay? And, and, and the main most uh, uh, the kind of leading reason at the level of practicalities is that using actions means using Feynman diagrams. 99% of the time, we use Feynman diagrams to compute in perturbation theory, and Feynman diagrams are incredibly complex. Okay? Now, uh, the simplest example of this, which you'll probably see in any beginning of an amplitudes talk, so I'm most legally required to show you, is let's say the kind of next to simplest process, which is a five-point gluon amplitude. Okay, so they gl gluons in perturbation theory, tree-level scattering in, in Yang-Mills theory. You could compute this using the kind of standard methods in your favorite textbook, say Peskin and Schroeder or Schwartz or whatever. And famously, this is uh, many, many terms. Okay, so of course, it involves things like polarization. So let me just write down like a sample type expression. P1, E2, P2, E3, P3, E4. Okay, so there's, there's, there's kind of polarizations in play, there's momenta in play, and then there's propagators that come from uh, Feynman propagators. So here, P1 squared plus P4 plus P5 squared. Okay, terms that look like this, okay? Plus hundreds of others, okay? So there's hundreds of Feynman diagrams. It's incredibly complicated, and if you knew nothing other than that what was in your kind of standard Feynman diagram textbook, this would just be the correct answer, okay? It would just be these hundreds of terms. Now, uh, famously, and as I think maybe even intimated, uh, uh, in, in the previous lecture, but also by the er earlier ones by, by Adam Falkowski, there are better ways to write this answer which uh, connect with some of the ideas of amplitudes. In particular, uh, rather than talk about a five particle amplitude in terms of polarizations, which as I'll harp on a lot during my set of lectures, are very redundant kind of bad variables for many reasons, you can write this in a more physical uh, way in terms of what are called spinner helicity variables. So this is really just meant to be an illustration uh, which I'll dig into a bit more, but let's say instead of labeling these by polarizations, I label the external states, one to five, by their actual helicities, right? So for a four-dimensional massless vector, we have two polarizations, plus and minus. So I can actually think about putting these into some physical configuration, let's say all of them being minus helicity in an incoming uh, 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 a convention, and just write down what that function is, okay? So the point is, you could think of these momenta as random variables and epsilon, uh, the polarizations as random, but secretly they have to satisfy the physical constraint that the external states actually have helicity, that the momenta sum to zero, and p squared equals zero for massless particles. Okay. Now when you do that, you find famously that this is zero, okay? So in other words, these hundreds of terms are just a very complicated rewriting of zero. You find it's many, almost every other combination of this thing is zero, except for a handful, which are called the so-called MHV amplitudes. <clears throat> and the ones that aren't zero, let's say one example would be if there's two minuses and, and, uh, and three pluses, have a very simple form in terms of spinner helicity variables. Okay, so let me just write down uh, one example of this. D3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 1. Okay, these are angle brackets formed from those spinner helicity variables you saw in, in the previous or previous lectures. And the point is this is a single monomial. Okay, so hundreds of terms become a simple expression. Now on the one hand, this is just easier to compete with. You can see that, well, it's, I shouldn't say it's easier to compete with. It suggests and tells you that the way that we compute is overly redundant. It has built into it extreme redundancy, giving hundreds of terms, which secretly is one term. Okay, so the way we compute has some intrinsic issue in, in the sense of it being not minimal. But on top of that, as just physicists, when we see nice expressions, it's, it, it begs the question, why is this simple? Is there a way of computing this directly? And does it give me a sign of some deeper, uh, deeper level of physics? Okay? And in fact, this, this is kind of a nice uh, uh, you know, toy example of how amplitudes people think. Okay? We compute something, we write it in the most elegant possible way, and we ask, why does it have this crazy simple structure? Okay? Now, this is, uh, the, the nice structure of this doesn't, isn't just some random example. This has actually inspired multiple 
insights, actual insights, into connections of Yang-Mills theory with really high-level physics. So if you know anything about the so-called celestial conformal field theory program, celestial CFT, it largely is built on understanding why this thing has this structure. In fact, if you know anything about uh, CFTs, you'll realize that this has the structure of a conformal field theory correlator in two dimensions. Okay, which is something we might touch on maybe in, in later lectures if I get uh, if I have time for it. But this has that structure. If you just showed it to your friend who works on CFTs, they'd recognize that. And that actually has a backstory which lets you relate four-dimensional Yang Mills theory to something which is putatively a two-dimensional CFT. Now we don't know the properties of that CFT or if it truly exists or is consistent, but that's a sign of looking at the data in the answer and letting it tell you whether there's some structure. Another classic example is the uh, Witten's twister string from 2003 where he looked at these objects and realized they're calculated some topological string theory in lower dimensions. So there's lots of connections you can kind of draw to understand why this, why, why this um, uh, structure might exist. And that's kind of the first thing we do in Apple II. It's compute something, understand the best way to write it simply, and then figure out if there's physics behind that simplicity. Now, this kind of simplicity transcends, uh, it transcends simply uh, gauge theory. This, of course, is Yang-Mills theory. This is the theory of gluons. You could ask, well, is this some special property of gauge theories which we know are nice? Uh, it's not. It transcends that. In fact, one thing I'll talk a lot about is graviton amplitudes. Okay, so it's not something you're, you're maybe super familiar with, but it's the same spirit as gluon amplitudes. By graviton amplitudes, I mean the following. So, again, just so we're on the same page. So imagine you write down the Einstein-Hilbert action, which is root G. This is uh, Ricci scalar. All these quantities depend on some metric, g mu nu, which we can expand about flat space. If you want, I could put those M planks in here. Okay, so we take the metric expanded about flat space plus a perturbation. Okay, we think about this as a quantum field theory in flat space of an h mu nu degree of freedom, and then we just compute. Okay? Physically, this corresponds to the quantum scattering amplitudes for small massless spin two tensor fluctuations about a flat background, and we can compute just like we computed here an amplitude between gravitons, okay? Now, uh, graviton, again, is a massless uh, spinning particle. It, again, has two polarizations, the plus and cross helicities familiar from gravitational waves, but we can study what that amplitude is. And the whole point of this is that it's equally simple, if not more simple. So uh, a classic example would be just two to two scattering of gravitons, okay? Those gravitons have polarizations. Uh, you could write it in a terrible, messy way. So you could compute it using Feynman diagrams were computed by DeWitt and Feynman ages ago. That Feynman diagram calculation for four point is insanely brutal. The expression's like 100 kilobytes. I couldn't even show it to you if you wanted to look at it. And it's just a mess of things that look like this. But when you write it in terms of nice variables, the good variables, which in this case are spinner helicity, you find that for the only combination where it's non-zero, it takes on the extremely simple uh, form of, again, a monomial, angle one, two to the fourth, three, four to the fourth over STU. And again, if, you don't, if you're maybe not so familiar with these angles and squares, or maybe you didn't connect fully with the previous lectures, I'll, I'll dive into that, or at least I'll recap that a bit later. The point here, though, is these angle and square brackets are not containing some buried, you know, huge amount of structure. They're extremely simple remappings of the usual momenta for P1, P2, P3, P4, and so on. Okay? So the point here is that for gravity, this is gra gra GR, this here is Yang-Mills, these are extremely simple expressions. While the way we normally compute is immensely complicated and suggests a better way of computing, which is precisely uh, what Amplitudes was kind of first designed for. Okay? Now, why is there such complication? Well, hopefully you know the reason why is that there was secretly redundancy built into all of these, which is that polarization E, okay? The fact that there's a polarization means that way back in, our, way back in the, you know, the backstory for these theories, we thought we wrote down something which had a gauge symmetry. Okay, so famously in, in, Yang, in uh, gauge theory, let's say QED, we have gauge symmetries where uh, we write down an action and we say it's invariant under this, and maybe if we're a little imperfect with our language, we might call it a symmetry. But hopefully uh, you know, uh, even at this stage, that gauge symmetry is not a symmetry in any actual sense. It's not actually physical. It's something which is purely a, f a part of a formulation for how human beings on Earth decided to describe the physics. It's not required for anything. The best way to understand that is the first thing you do when you have a gauge theory is you gauge fix. <laughs> Otherwise, you can't compute. You have to gauge fix your propagators. You have to gauge fix. How precious can something be if you have, to, you have to fix it? Well, the point, of course, is that it's just a trick for manifesting two things at the same time. Those two things 
our Lorentz symmetry. Okay, it's the fact that we want to write down a degree of freedom that's a vector. So we want to write down a mu, which has four degrees of freedom in four dimensions. The polarizations are only two, so four is too many. So we have to break down uh, those number of deg degrees of freedom by modding out, by redundancy, and then fixing a gauge. Okay? So th this is the origin of what gauge symmetry is. For the case of the graviton, we have something analogous. So in this kind of linearized level uh, for the graviton, there's something similar where we can transform by some derivative of a vector, okay, plus corrections for nonlinearities, but the same basic idea. Okay, they have redundancy built into it, and that's instantiated in the amplitude by polarizations. And on the, the kind of second step is that the, pol the, the, the amplitudes then have to satisfy Ward identities. Okay, so if you recall, what is the Ward identity? It tells you that when you take those polarizations and you shift them by momenta, that is to say, when you take E and you shift E goes to E plus P, which is precisely this kind of transformation, your physics should be the same. Okay. That in, just at the very heart of it introduces a redundancy that forces you to have many terms in your expressions. So ironically, while gauge symmetry is illuminating in many ways, it, one thing it is not illuminating in is writing down your amplitude in a way that's maximally simple or could maximally uh, reveal structure. So gauge symmetry is the origin of this redundancy. Now for that reason you might, work, you might think, well okay, let's not think about gauge theories, let's not think about gravity, let's just think about scalars, okay? You say, let's say I just restrict to scalars, I'm gonna talk about infotons, Higgs bosons, pions, phonons, I'm gonna keep real safe, and surely none of this will bother me. That isn't true either, okay? The redundancy I'm talking about here goes beyond simple gauge type symmetries or, or diffeomorphism symmetries in the case of gravity. It's endemic to every QFT, okay? So let me show you a particularly kind of demented version of that or illustration of that, which will return in this class off and on, uh, which is a scalar field theory, uh, which uh, 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 has some interesting properties. Okay. So consider the following, scalar field theory. This is meant to be an illustration that redundancy applies across the board to any QFT. Uh, consider the following uh, a scalar field theory. So d phi d phi okay, times some function g of phi. Okay, so you've already taken the effective field theory series, so you know that it's sensible to talk about a theory like this provided we have some notion of power counting. Okay, so this g here if I was, let me be a little more explicit here, this G phi is something which I have assumed to start, let's say, at, at one, so that's a canonically normalized uh, real scalar, plus lambda one phi, plus lambda two phi squared over two, and so on, okay, in fact, keep going, plus lambda three over three factorial phi cubed, and so on, okay. Where I'm just literally parametrizing all these higher dimension operators, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, with completely unknown coefficients. Okay, I've, I've chosen nothing to be special about this theory, except that it has two derivatives, okay? Now, okay, this just seems some run-of-the-mill EFT you might write down. Um, uh, let's think about how rich the dynamics of this theory is. So, the first thing we do in amplitude is we compute. Okay, so let's compute a scattering amplitude. Uh, let's start with, uh, uh, in this very simple toy example, A3, the three-particle amplitude, which you draw, you know, as this three-particle uh, a Feynman diagram, what is it? <coughs> okay, so minus lambda one times P1, P2, plus P2, P3, plus P3, P1. Okay, that's all it is, right? The Feynman rule is just momenta dot momenta summed three different ways, all great. But we realize something uh, kind of amusing here, which is that this expression, uh, let me write it down over here, is actually zero. <coughs> okay, it's zero. Because if I'm writing down a three particle amplitude, I need to keep things on shell, which means I should have all my momenta summed to zero. So sum of pi equals zero. And also pi squared should equal the masses, which I'm assuming to be massless in this case. Okay. Now these conditions actually imply that this thing is zero. To see that, I just realized that this thing is equal to one half lambda one of p1 squared plus p2 squared plus p3 squared. How did I get this expression? Well, you realize that P1 dot P2 is secretly, okay, so secretly P1 dot P2 is of course P1 plus P2 squared, okay, divided by two, minus P1 squared minus P2 squared. Right? So 
I can just take P1 plus P2, square it to get that cross term, subtract the diagonal terms, and divide by 2. But of course, this thing here is just P3 squared. Okay. So for three-particle scattering, there are no invariants you can write that are not zero <coughs> because everything is either P1 squared, P2 squared, or P3 squared, okay, which we've done here, which is why this is actually zero, crucially on shell. Okay. At some point, I'm going to stop emphasizing that every expression is on shell but because we're doing on shell scattering amplitudes, but that is uh, 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 maybe important to just state here at the, at the top. This is vanishing. Now you can keep going. So let's let's say, okay, that was funny. Four point vanished. Let me compute uh, three point vanished. Let me compute four point. For four point, you'll find that there is, of course, exchange diagrams like this, and ST and U channels. There's a contact diagram. Uh, let me just write down the expression, and we'll see what happens in this case. So we have a term that looks like minus lambda two, which is the contact term, times S plus T plus U. Okay, plus the factorization terms where something's actually exchanged, and this looks like minus lambda one squared over four times s squared over s plus t squared over t plus u squared over u. Okay, which by the way is all zero because s plus t plus u equals zero. Okay, so in other words, the four point contact term is zero, the s is canceled, t's cancel, u's cancel to give s plus t plus u, which is also zero. So the four-point amplitude is zero, okay? And now you're starting to get a little worried, maybe a little suspicious. Compute five-point, six-point, go all the way to 14-point, which is 15 trillion diagrams, they're all zero. Every amplitude in this S matrix is zero. This is a trivial theory, okay? This has no scattering amplitudes. Now, if you didn't know anything more about QFT or amplitudes, that might seem mysterious. In fact, you might even ask your experimentalist friend to go measure lambda one and be confused. Well, everyone would be confused. What's the bound on lambda one? I'm confused because it doesn't show up in anything that I see. Well, the crucial point is that this Lagrangian is very misleading because it's secretly the same as a Lagrangian for a free theory, which leads us to the redundancy that even scalar fields have, which I think was also touched on in the past, which relates to something called field basis or field redefinitions. And it is a fact about, uh, uh, about well, theories in general, but it's a especially kind of strange looking in, th in the context of amplitudes which is that if you take a field phi and you send the field phi to phi uh, to some function f of phi, okay, the on-shell S matrix is the same. It's unchanged provided also the stipulation that f prime of zero equals one, okay, which is just another way of saying that if this was some expansion, it looks like phi plus terms that are nonlinear in phi. So phi plus nonlinear in phi. Okay, it just asks that the first derivative about zero for phi, ab about f is, is, is still one, and then the rest can be anything. So, so as an example, you can imagine, for example, this could be like phi plus some k times phi squared. Okay? That, that would be something you could transform phi to. Now, uh, this is well known, it's something called Hogg's theorem, and more broadly is well known in effective field theory. But if you do this transformation, this, the claim is not that it's a symmetry. So the claim is not that the Lagrangian is invariant under this transformation. It very manifestly is not invariant. If you send phi to some random function f of phi, this Lagrangian changes. But the on-shell scattering amplitudes, and in fact, anything actually physical that you can measure in an experiment, doesn't care and won't matter. Okay, or at least will, I should say, transform appropriately to that change of variables. Um, so again, it may seem crazy, but it's just true. What that, what that implies is that you can actually find a, f a function little f, which maps this to an equivalent Lagrangian, which is just the free Lagrangian. Okay, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna compute that here, but I leave it to you as an exercise. You can always engineer order by order in perturbation theory at any given order, some f of phi, which maps this to a free theory, which explains in one line why we got a vanishing S matrix. These are secretly the same theory, even though they have different Lagrangians. Now, again, the reason why this isn't at all puzzling is you do it all the time in classical physics. Okay, so a, a great example where this happens universally is classical physics. You could start with a Lagrangian and Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z, and then you can go to spherical coordinates. That operation does not leave the Lagrangian invariant, right? It doesn't, it doesn't literally send x, y, z to r theta phi. The Lagrangian changes. Now, even though the Lagrangian changes and the equations of the motion change and everything changes, if you compute something physical, an actual physical thing, like a binding energy, 
right? Or, 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 or you know, anything that you would actually measure. It shouldn't matter, matter whether you use Cartesian or polar or spherical coordinates. Okay. So this is just a restatement of that, which is also a restatement that when we write a partition function, okay, when we write down a partition function, we think of it as some path integral of e to the minus s sourced by j. Okay, so uh, uh, the, 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 the fields in QFT are auxiliary. When we write down the path in a row, we sum over all configurations of the field. So if I change field variables, I will still get the same answer. Okay. Now, of course, we can compute certain things that aren't manifestly uh, uh, field basis invariant, like correlation functions. These would show up, for instance, in inflation, where we have, let's say, 5x1, 5x2, and so on. Those are not invariant, unlike S matrix amplitudes, but they are covariant. So in other words, as long as you do this transformation and make sure that in your new correlator of phi's, you wrote them as correlators of f of phi's, you'll get the same answer. Okay, so the important thing isn't so much the total invariance, but knowing that there is a redundancy intrinsic to this. The magic of S matrix is that you don't even have to care about that redundancy uh, at all. As, as you do this, if you do this operation, uh, you'll never get a change in the physics. Another example, which may be a little more familiar, which isn't purely just classical physics, is actually in EFTs, okay? So I'll mention this too, because I think maybe it got brought up previously. In EFTs, we continually change field bases, and we're not too surprised by it. One very famous example is the chiral Lagrangian. Okay? And this is, again, something we'll return to. In the chiral Lagrangian, say in chi chiral perturbation theory, the description of low energy mesons in the chiral limit, we write down the leading action, which is some du, du inverse du trace, okay? Where u is some, you know, commonly written as some e to the i pi field over f pi, okay? Now this is one particular way of parameterizing a unitary matrix, the exponential of i times a Hermitian matrix. But there's other ways. So there's other ways, for instance, an, an alternative way is you could write one plus i pi over f pi over one minus i pi over f pi. In fact, there's an infinite number of ways, okay? There is no like a correct parameterization of this pi on field inside this group uh, U. They're all fine, okay? You can do any kind of perturbative field redefinition amongst them. They're just different ways of coordinatizing the coset which generated this symmetry breaking. So that's one very uh, well-known example. Another example is uh, GR, which I just mentioned up here, where for instance, g mu nu, we wrote as eta mu nu plus h mu nu with normalization, but you could have imagined other terms. I could have imagined h squared mu nu and so on. Okay, there's an infinite number of ways of writing the graviton field and its relationship to the metric. Whichever one you choose will not affect your physics. Okay, and it really seems like a miracle when you're computing, but it is there. Okay, uh, maybe I can harp on just one more thing just because it, uh, any questions about any of that? Yes, okay. So um, maybe at the risk of saying something that uh, you've already gone over, I do want to just mention that uh, there, there's uh, this uh, notion of field redefinitions that we've discussed. It's very common in effective field theories. I may I'll just say it quickly, and then if you have questions, maybe at another time you can ask. But usually we think of a field redefinition where this delta phi is subleading, either in a small parameter or in an effective field theory expansion. In which case, we can take the Lagrangian, and under the shift, it looks like delta phi times some variation of the Lagrangian, which is just the equation of motion of phi. Okay, so by definition, if I take a field and I shift it by some perturbation, the Lagrangian shifts by that perturbation times the equation of motion. That's, of course, how the variational principle tells us the equation of motion. But it, it, in this kind of different angle, what it tells us is if we change variables, we induce terms that are proportional to the equation of motion. So on occasion, you'll see someone working in an effective field theory and say something like, oh, this operator is proportional to the equations of motion, so I can eliminate it with the field redefinition. That's what they're saying. They're saying shift phi by some small amount, the action shifts by something proportional to the equation of motion. So by appropriately choosing delta phi, you can eliminate such terms. Okay. Now, of course, the important thing to realize is that this is just the first term in this expansion. Right? It's the first variation of delta phi that's give this equation of motion. If you want to do this properly, you have to do delta phi squared and so on, and that's the full field redefinition. But within perturbation theory at the leading order, removing equations of motion is the statement of field redefinitions. This is used continually in SMAFT, GR, uh, those are probably maybe the most uh, well-known uh, context where this happens. Okay, any questions about that? 
All right, so what's the upshot here? So the upshot here is that even scalar field theories have an insane amount of redundancy. That is to say, any choice uh, that maps phi to any other function of phi, f of phi, uh, which means that the number of Lagrangians to mapping to theories is infinity to one. Okay, so uh, again, kind of returning to the original point of all this, you can imagine starting with a Lagrangian one, your favorite version of, let's say, the standard model Lagrangian from the textbook. But we know that we can map that through a field redefinition to an infinite class of other Lagrangians that look different just by either, let's say, changing field basis, changing uh, uh, gauge fixing, anything you like. Okay? So there's an infinite set of Lagrangians, but all of them point to exactly the same amplitude and exactly the same S matrix. There's no difference between them. Okay. So the first pitfall is the fact I'm trying to hammer in here, which is Lagrangians, and in some invariant sense, are not meaningless, but they have a huge redundancy, which can obscure a structure. So for instance, maybe your favorite Lagrangian, L1, has every possible hidden structure you could ever imagine to find inside gravity or inside gauge theory. But more likely than not, sometimes a Lagrangian manifests something and doesn't manifest other things. So what would you want to do if you wanted to abstractly search for structure? Well, you could keep looking at different Lagrangians until you find other properties, but you don't really know what you're looking for. Obviously, a much more direct path is to just mod out by this redundancy by computing an amplitude, which, as I've said, does not care what field basis you're in at all, and study its intrinsic properties. Okay? So that's the reason to look at the amplitude. It eliminates all the gauge redundancies, field basis redundancies. It's the, all, everything stripped away uh, except the physics, which is why, at a, at a fun, not just to practically make calculations better, but at a real sense of like physical uh, uh, principles, it actually is the better way to write the amplitude, okay, if you want to learn something from it. <clears throat> now, with that said, let me now give kind of a, a brief uh, uh, overview of the kinds of new things and applications that have fallen out of this project, uh, out of this program. Uh, this is meant to be kind of a big roadmap. I'm going to co cover, as I'll say, some of the things, but not, definitely not all of them. Uh, if anything, this is more meant to be an invitation so that if offline or during discussions you have a question, I can just talk for another hour about one of these topics. But I will kind of split the kind of uh, uh, things we've learned or used in Amplitude between two, uh, two columns, structure and applications. Okay. By structure, I roughly mean things that it's teaching us about theories and theory space and quantum field theory. What kinds of things? Well, uh, one of the things that I'll probably dedicate one or more le lectures to is something called the double copy. Okay, it's still to me one of the most miraculous uh, features um, that have been found. Uh, it means many things, has many uh, 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 acronyms, including KLT, BCJ, color kinematics, well, lots of words, but broadly speaking, they're known as the double copy. And it says uh, uh, the following thing. It says that gravitational amplitudes, Okay, so gravity amplitude, just like the one I wrote down at some point before, two to two graviton, endpoint graviton scattering amplitudes, can all be expressed algebraically, that is to say in terms of products and sums of gauge theory amplitudes in a mechanical simple formula. Okay, so what I mean, uh, uh, I'll put this uh, here is, is roughly what it, what it says. The amplitude for GR is like the amplitude for yang mills theory squared. That's how it's usually shown. Um, uh, on the one hand, it's incredibly practical to use. Uh, I think everyone is in agreement, almost at this point, in, at least in perturbation theory, the best way to compute in gravity is to not com compute in gravity. Don't compute in gravity at all. Compute in Yang-Mills theory, where you're sitting on decades of effort to, uh, de uh, pushed towards collider physics, and then apply a super mechanical explicit operation to get gravity from it. Okay. Now I'll, t I'll, talk, I'll introduce this for the case of gravity, but as it turns out, this transcends gravity. This is a property of other parts of the standard model, including the chiral Lagrangian. So the chiral Lagrangian is also participates in this kind of structure. Other theories that have shown up in the literature, like the Galileon, Born-Infeld theory, uh, they all kind of participate. Okay, so this is kind of interesting web of theories uh, that all have names and all have shown up in HEPTH for various reasons, and they're connected by algebraic uh, relations exactly like this giving you a shortcut to competing whatever you want. Okay, so I'll unpack that probably uh, at, at uh, relatively great length. Uh, I'll also talk about the QFT of this, okay? So uh, the context in which this is true, or at least it was discovered, was perturbative on-shell scattering amplitudes, 
Okay. But we now have a way better understanding of why it's true, when it's true, in a broader class of theories. In fact, one of the things I'll talk about is the proof of why a structure like this exists for the chiral Lagrangian, for pions. Okay? Um, so we're going to return to QFT, if you like. But in my view, this is a property of QFT. It's not in the textbooks, obviously. But it has a lot banking on it. Why is there a lot banking on it? Well, if you can write something in gravity, if something is not in gravity, <laughs> That has import, right? ADS-CFT is built on the entire idea that things in gravitational uh, context are confusing. Uh, uh, so we use holography to map it to something which we can understand. To whatever extent this applies more broadly, th this is a different version of that. This, I'm not saying this is holography or ADS-CFT, but it gives you a connection between a hard problem and a much easier problem. And that's just intrinsically uh, uh, fascinating and not explained, I will say. Broadly speaking, not explained. That's one thing. Uh, and maybe another thing I'll mention, again, I'm, I'm, uh, so I will, I will harp on this a lot, so let me put a star here, so I will talk about this. Some things I will not talk about so much, but I can, I'm happy to t tell you uh, uh, offline. Celestial CFT, the thing I just mentioned before about how if you just study scattering amplitudes, you can just ask, what's another way of computing this? And people have realized that if you think about the sky, like literally the sky, the celestial spheres and like the angles on the sky, theta and phi, two dimensions, and think of there being a conformal field theory on that sky and compute correlation functions in a particular way, you can get the, 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 the low energy part of yang mills from it and in gravity. So there's a connection uh, very rich, uh, really pioneered by Andy Strominger and his, his uh, uh, collection of collaborators on this. Uh, again, not something I'll go into in depth. Something else, which I also won't go into depth, but I thought I'd mention, is uh, the topic of kind of polyhedra and amplitudehedra. Okay, so this is something which uh, you've probably heard about. Uh, Nimar Khanihamad is, is, of course, one of the pioneers in this, of thinking about scattering amplitudes in a different way, where they're not the output of some Feynman diagram calculation or even some more streamlined version of it, but rather the amplitudes themselves are volumes of some other space. Okay, so the idea is you think of there or imagine that there's some other abstract space where the volumes computed in that space are the amplitudes. The different ways that we compute are different ways of computing a volume. So you can take a volume and you compute it by chopping it up this way and summing the pieces, or chopping up this way and summing those pieces. And those different ways are Feynman diagrams or uh, recursion relations or other methods that we know uh, in play. Yes? Yeah. Very good. So uh, in its original instantiation, it was understood, uh, proven at tree level. So it's a pr proven tree level statement for many theories. It's been, if you like, folded into higher loop because in amplitudes, the way we think about loops is through generalized unitarity, where we take tree and feed it into the loops. So uh, loops are built from trees consistently, which means it's fed now into higher loop and has not failed. Although I would say it's still conjectural that it's true, but it has never failed yet to compute something. In fact, it's used for high order calculations. Whether it holds non-perturbatively is an open question, but it definitely can hold for uh, not non-perturbative in coupling, but non-perturbative in field value, uh, it can be done. Yeah. Uh, very good. So uh, there exist many versions now that are in curved space, so it's transcended flat space. So I. Probably won't get to this, but I'm happy to tell you more about it. You can put this in ADS, DS, maximally symmetric spaces. There's also something called the care, uh, the uh, classical double copy, which is kind of not quite simply connected, connected, but not exactly the same as this, where it's also about broader uh, uh, curve space times. But at this point, we understand, at least in some instances, curve space, fully curve space versions of this. Yeah. Uh, good. So uh, I should say it's been done in curve space for not the GR case, but for the simpler case of, let's say, pions, phi cubed, Carl Lagrangian, and Yamos. Not full gravity. We don't know full gravity sufficiently to put it in curve space, make it non-perturbative, or all loop order. So it's an open question, <laughs> if you like. Uh, I mean, it's like 2024, and I'm saying there's something about GR that no one actually knows the answer to. Okay. Uh, de definitely, yeah. This is, this is the thing that's even surprising, I think, to like, Gravi LIGO gravitational wave physicists, like, like wait, this isn't, like, where is this thing? What is this? This is not in the textbooks. It's not, it's not uh, I should say, uh, it's not the usual gauge theory of gravity type formulations. Again, it's something I could talk about, but there's a well-known uh, way of reframing gravity as a gauge theory called the Palatini formalism, tetradic Palatini, uh, Plavansky, self-dual Plavansky. There's like a million versions of this, okay, teleparallel gravity. 
None of those are this double copy. Okay. Let me not explain why, but it's a factual statement. It's not the same thing. Uh, maybe it could lead to insight about it, but it's not the same thing, sadly. <clears throat> so it's an open question. Um, good. Any other? Uh, I'm, I'm of course going to roll back to this, and this is mainly to kind of get all these ideas out so we can discuss them. But uh, but but that's that's uh, that's uh, some things. I was I was in the middle of telling you about the amplitohedron. Uh, very recently, there's been a ton of very cool progress again from Nima and his cohort. I think Nima put out like ten papers in the last two months on this. You probably saw this. Like, what is what's happening here? Uh, he described it as the most excitement he's had in a decade on this, and I actually I understand why. Let me mention one thing just because the, the the kind of ramifications of it will blow your mind. Uh, he uh, there 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 are new insights now. We're using these ideas. You can take things in phi cube theory. Phi cube theory is in like tree level, one loop, two loop, phi cubed amplitudes. Do a magic trick on them, like an algebraic manipulation of those integrands, and get from them for free at the same loop order, Yang Mills, Chiral Lagrangian, and so on. Okay? So I'm talking about getting like high loop gluons from phi cube theory, like the most trivial theory you can imagine. Okay. Again, I will not talk about that, at least uh, maybe informally I could tell you about it, uh, what I know, but it's fascinating, and there's some kind of dual picture here where on the one hand this would really make calculations simpler but two like what how is this happening like who ordered this how is this even conceivable so that's that's uh, th that, that's on the side of kind of structures and kind of other uh, roughly speaking magical things that have popped out this is not at all in, uh, an inclusive list there's other things like scattering equations and twister theory and and so on that I that I, I could keep going but let me let me uh, uh, cut, cut it off here in terms of applications, there's many. So there's, of course, colliders, um, uh, which you heard about earlier or earlier today. I won't talk about that at all. Okay, obviously, it has a role to play, uh, but, but since it's being focused on by others, I won't talk about it. Uh, there's another place where there have been applications, and again, these are kind of more historical. These are kind of older, uh, these kind of... Uh, pre-2010 type uh, things, I would say, uh, which is also supergravity. So uh, people were interested in high loop order calculations in gravity and supergravity uh, because of enticing kind of finiteness properties. So gravity naively seems like it would be the worst possible theory to compute in, but it has these bizarre properties, like for instance, it's finite in one loop. Not 100% not well appreciated by everyone, but uh, 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 GR is more finite than Yang Mills, <laughs> uh, at least at one loop, and then it goes crazy after that in four dimensions. Um, so it has nice properties. There's a general program to understand these ultraviolet properties, and the way this program was spearheaded by Zvi Byrne and his collaborators was by computing in Yang Mills and then squaring it to get gravity. Okay? So that's, in fact, how these ideas were invented by, uh, by, by, by these folks. Again, something I won't talk about at all. <clears throat> now, this was kind of older work, let's say maybe pre 2010 ish or 2000 whatever ish. Uh, more recently, and these are things that are, do not make an appearance in my old TASI lectures because they're all things that happened post, I think, roughly 2016 in terms of the big developments, was gravitational waves. Okay, so one thing was realized was well, there's an experimental program that cares about gravitational observables. I've told you the gravitational observables are more easily computed in a dual way. And we, 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 we learned how to take these tricks and amplitude methods to compute new quantities that are observable by LIGO, which are essentially governing the motions of black holes in binary and spiral. So the kind of basic problem, physics problem, is you have two black holes or a black hole neutron star or some configuration. They're in orbit. They have some potential that's not Newtonian because it's general relativity. And just calculating that potential is super hard. Okay. And, and that's why, as it turns out, the state-of-the-art calculations in what's called post-Minkowski expansion, which is expansion in G. Newton, are not done, were not done and are not done by the gravitational wave people, but by amplitudes people. They've now been eaten by that field in the sense that all the kind of tools are all mixed up. Okay? So this uh, ended up becoming a real thing where actual progress happened that could, in principle, be relevant for the experiment. I'll maybe touch on this and, and, and tell you what some of those insights were. Another aspect is cosmology, which I have less to say about. But even in the last couple of years or so, there's been an understanding that we can think about things like polyhedra, about unitarity, all in terms of a cosmological context where the natural variables are not amplitudes, but are in fact uh, cosmological correlation functions or wave coefficient of the wave function of the universe or, and, and so on. Okay. So that's uh, uh, two more things. And then maybe one thing I'll, I will mention and talk about is 
uh, hopefully I get to, which is positivity and dispersions, dispersion relations, okay. So um, uh, surely if you've read HEPTH in the last uh, five years or so, you, you realize there's a lot of papers now on kind of using generalized principles like, or like not principles like uh, unitarity, uh, 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 factorization and uh, uh, Lorentz invariance to like learn about Wilson coefficients in an effective field theory. An example of that is EFT hedron, uh, moment bounds, uh, semi-definite programming type methods, which are all kind of in the spirit of the kind of the conformal bootstrap to like rigidly and with precision rule out theories. Uh, and this is a very exciting uh, area, uh, and it also connects to like super deep questions. I would say so. One one aspect of it is basically to use consistency to rule out effective field theories. To be like, well, you could have an experiment and you can measure these Wilson coefficients, but if these Wilson coefficients don't have values in this region, then I can show you that QFT is wrong or that you know, either Lorentz invariance or unitarity fails. Okay, those are strong statements. There's a broader set of questions you can ask, which I also will hopefully touch on, which has to do with using these methods to ask really high-minded questions. So one of those questions, which I think I will maybe get to, is about UV completion, okay? Uh, many, some of you, or maybe even some of your friends, are probably string theorists. And usually the way string theory is presented is it's like, okay, here's a textbook, here's some things we would assume. Let's imagine objects that are not point-like, but, but have uh, co-dimension, uh, that, that have extent, and then let's quantize them. Okay, that's fine. Um, but you can frame the question of how special is string theory very nicely from the language of amplitudes because we have string amplitudes. Okay? Am string amplitudes have nice, beautiful expressions we can study. One thing you can ask from the point of view of dispersion relations and positivity is what is the minimal set of constraints on an amplitude A that spits out the string amplitude? What makes string amplitude special from the point of view of these functions? What, to what mathematical question is string theory the answer? Okay? And again, this is a case where stating things purely in terms of functions can actually give us an output uh, a certain rigidity uh, to theories that we've studied forever, but with kind of a different understanding of why they're unique. Not simply because we're quantizing the Nambu-Gotu action, but rather because there aren't other functions we could write down that satisfy the same types of constraints. Okay, good. Uh, any questions about that? So this is like the broad overview. I'm, I'm basically gonna talk mostly about this and this for the latter parts of the lecture, um, uh, for the mid to latter parts of the lecture. Um, but before that, let me give you a full outline of what I'll actually do. Uh, and again, I think I may actually go f a little fast on some of these because I think you've been treated to some of it already. Um, so here's here's my uh, rough start to finish here. So we'll be in kind of three three parts. So in the very beginning, again, I think I have to be responsible. I'm just going to talk about the bootstrap. And by the bootstrap, I mean like what I really explicitly, concretely mean when I say start from principles, go to the amplitude. Like that should that should if you're if you're a responsible physicist should feel like I'm cheating like how is this possible how do you get something from nothing I need to show you how that works uh, and it's not as mysterious as it sounds right. essentially we write down a space of functions made of the kinematic invariance and then we impose constraints that's it okay. but maybe seeing it explicitly you'll learn why gauge theory is inevitable gravity is inevitable okay so there's a certain kind of overarching lesson here, which is that even though we're gonna kind of rederive things you know, we're gonna learn that the things you know are really rigid, okay? What do I mean by that? I mean that, you know, when, when, when you learned about the one on R squared force law in ENM or in gravity, you might think, oh yeah, certainly that's beautiful, and the reason it's beautiful is it could have been so many other things, but it was that one beautiful thing. We're usually told that. The laws of physics are beautiful, which suggests that there could have been a way they could have been different. But in fact, what we know and, and have learned, it's really in some sense common knowledge, is their rigidity means that you can't perturb them. <laughs> you can't deviate from that extremely elegant result that we have. Gauge theories are, are the, in some sense, only game in town once you know what precisely the physical assumptions are that enter in, into it, which as we'll see are basically nothing. Lorentz invariance and factorization. Okay, so we'll start with the bootstrap. Then we're gonna move on to what I'm gonna call IR and UV. Okay, so this will touch on things that have to do with the infrared properties of scattering. I'll talk about things like soft theorems. Soft theorems are theorems that dictate universally the properties of scattering when you take a particle and make it low energy. Okay, so this will connect with uh, some of the celestial things I mentioned. It'll connect with what makes a theory special. Uh, uh, that, that'll be one part of the story. 
I'll then connect that to, 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 to UV, which is my way of talking about positivity, where uh, essentially when people talk about positivity and things like dispersion relations, it's secretly a way of using amplitudes methods to connect UV to IR in kind of by the hip, at the hip in a way that is mathematically precise and links the two. People very often talk about UV IR mixing as kind of a vague notion that, that uh, stand in for like a deeper concept, but amplitudes is the one place where we can really take IR Wilson coefficients and relate them to stuff in the UV in a really explicit way, in a way that kind of illuminates both sides. So then I'll that's where I'll talk about um, positivity. I'm also going to talk a bit about um, effective field theories and their underlying geometry, uh, probably in this story. Uh, so if you've heard about things like standard model EFT and uh, geometry that underpins it, there's a secret geometry underlying it and all effective field theories, which connects with amplitudes. Okay. Uh, roughly, roughly speaking, the kind of tagline for that is that coupling constants are not invariant. Coupling constants, as much as you think of them as like a physical thing, they don't always show up in your S matrix. A great example is this, okay? Lambda one, lambda two, lambda three are coupling constants, but they don't show up anywhere. They're not, they're not physical, okay? So just because you can write a Lagrangian doesn't mean you can measure the parameter. It tells you that there's a much more invariant way to describe interactions, which are not coupling constants, uh, and that has to do with an underlying geometry in all theories. Okay. So I'll talk about geometry of field space also in this last case. And then in the very uh, final time, I'll talk about hidden structure, which will be double copy, essentially. Okay, good. Any questions about any of that? So, so I was kind of more maximally uh, inclusive in this discussion, mainly because I think it hopefully will tie into things we can talk about offshoots uh, in discussion if there's any interest. Otherwise, we can just push forward. Okay, so with that said, oh, how am I doing on time here? Uh, oh God, yeah. Uh, so I've said nothing for an hour, for 50 minutes. So let's, let's start saying things. So we're gonna start with the bootstrap, okay? So let's start with what principles we want to use to actually dictate the answer. Uh, I think normally I would start with spinner helicity, uh, but since you've already seen it a couple times, I'm actually not gonna start with spinner helicity. I'm gonna start with uh, maybe more generic dimensional statements, uh, and then talk a bit about uh, how, how it applies as a subcase to 4D spinner helicity. But the idea is the following. What is the bootstrap? Well, the bootstrap is the following. You write down a function for the amplitude. It could be some n particle amplitude, uh, and you just enforce constraints. Constraints are simple. Let me list them and then briefly elaborate on them. So first and foremost is just dimensional analysis. Okay, this is kind of an obvious one, but I'm stating it just so we know kind of precisely how we're going to be using it. Okay, the precise way that we're going to use it is the following. An n particle amplitude, <clears throat> so by amplitude an, I'm always stripping off the delta function support. Okay, so just like the function, the, 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 the non-delta function part of the amplitude has some fixed dimension in capital D dimensions, which is D plus n minus dn over two. Okay, this is just uh, an input, okay? This is fixed, you could compute this by computing the correlator uh, dimension, compute a correlation function in general D, uh, compute its mass dimension, apply LSZ, and this is the dimensionality you get, okay? So in the special case of D equals four, you have the uh, famous formula, this is four minus N, okay? Super low brow, but it's something we need to know if we're gonna compute the N particle amplitude is its overall dimension. The second thing we need to know, need to know is the dimensionality of your coupling constants. Okay, so uh, let's say, okay, we haven't even told you there's Lagrangian yet, but we know that the amplitude will depend on powers of a coupling constant. Kind of the more particles, the more couplings. Uh, as an example, we know that, for instance, in gauge theories, which I'm not yet assuming exist, but as an example, we know gauge theories have, have uh, uh, alpha, which has dimensions four minus D, which in D equals to four is dimensionless. Well, for instance, G Newton, in general dimension is two minus D, which in uh, D equals to four is dimension minus two. Okay, so these examples, G Newton alpha. Okay, so there's one of two options here. I could tell you this amplitude comes with this many powers of a coupling and that coupling has some dimension. Okay, that's, that's one thing, that's one way I could input my, my uh, assumptions. I could just say it has this many powers of alpha, alpha has, is zero dimensional, let's bootstrap. But you can of course see that imposing the, num the dimensionality coupling is the same as fixing the number of momenta, kinematic uh, momenta, in the actual amplitude, right? Because the overall amplitude has some dimension. Dimension comes from couplings and from momenta, 
which means that anything not from couplings is from momentum. Okay? So these are kind of two sides of the same coin. I could either tell you the amplitude has some power in, in momenta, that's secretly fixing the coupling constant's dimension, or I could fix the coupling constant and I'm secretly telling the number of derivative, the number of momenta in the amplitude. Okay? So those are the same information. Depending on what we do, we'll pick one or, or the other. All right, that's simple. That's really, really low level, but we'll use it very much, a lot. Uh, second thing is exchange symmetry, which again is very uh, basic. So by exchange symmetry, I, I just mean that I won't even write out what, I, what, what I'll just say it in words. If you have an amplitude and you have two external states that are identical, in the sense that they're identical bosons or identical fermions, then if you exchange them, you should get either plus one or minus one. Okay, that's it. So this is just a property of Bose symmetry. Uh, I'm intrinsically assuming kind of regular Bose Fermi statistics. Uh, and we're generally going to be working outside of uh, uh, lower dimensions, so we can, we can uh, uh, freely make that assumption. OK. Uh, next is Lorentz invariance. This is the big one. Lorentz invariance, which is just a way of saying that we use certain variables. So uh, one of the most common ones, which I'll use probably for the most of my discussion here, is Mandel stands. So Mandel stem invariance like pi dot pj, okay, is an example, but also spinner helicity. So we have spinner helicity, spinner helicity. So like ij, okay, ij, things like this, okay. But there are many other variables. So if you look in the amplitude's literature, there's things like um, uh, uh, momentum twisters. Dual momentum twisters. Um, there's uh, ambi twisters. There's like all these other the whole like stable of different ways of writing things, but the overarching picture is the same. You want to write down kinematic objects which transform nicely or linearly under the symmetries in play. When people talk about twisters, that symmetry is almost always conformal symmetry. So you want things that act under, under which conformal symmetry acts nicely. But if we just have Lorentz invariance, only Poincaré symmetry, then these are uh, sufficient uh, most of the time. Okay, so that's all this really means. Uh, there's a close cousin to Lorentz invariance, which is little group, which I'll mention when we talk about spinners, but let me not mention it yet. And then, uh, last but not least, at least for this uh, set of lectures, the other, last assumption will be factorization. Okay, by far the most non-trivial one. And um, what do I mean by that? So, factorization uh, just means just means the following. Okay, let me draw a picture for it, and then we'll use it. Okay, let's say I gave you a four-particle amplitude, A4. Okay, and I, I didn't tell you where I got it, if you like. I'm, I'm just giving it to you and I'm saying, trust me, it's a consistent, fine looking thing. Well, how would you check that it's consistent? Well, one property of a four particle amplitude is that it could have singularities in it. And by that I mean when you take the momenta and you move them around, you're gonna hit a pole. Okay, in other words, this thing, uh, for a tree level amplitude, I should say, tree level factorization, this amplitude has singularities, as we know would come from Feynman propagators if you compute it in the standard way. But uh, from a more general perspective, uh, we know the following condition should hold. Okay, let me, let me just call this factorization. So let me take the limit here. Limit of S minus M squared as, as S goes to M squared. Okay, so the idea here is I'm taking an amplitude and I'm taking S, Mandel stamp S, and I'm sending it towards M squared, where M squared is the mass of something in the spectrum. The idea here is that this uh, function is going to degenerate into two processes. Okay, this is like me tuning P1 and P2, tuning my initial conditions, so that I'm going on resonance with an intermediate state whose mass is m squared. Okay, so in other words, I'm, 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 uh, I'm taking this limit after multiplying by an inverse propagator, if you like, and then as s goes to m squared, this thing should break into a product of two tree amplitudes. So it turns out with a minus sign to maintain the uh, positive norm states, but uh, this is some A3 and this is some other A3. Okay. So this looks very much like a statement about maybe Feynman diagrams or factorization, but it's more general than that. Okay. The idea here is that um, okay. the idea here is that um, is that um, uh, uh, this is a constraint on the amplitude, which if it failed would mean either that there is no state that's exchanged at all, which is perfectly consistent, or that that state doesn't have mass m squared. But if I assume there is a state m squared, that is to say if there is a three particle amplitude in play, then this should factorize it if this uh, thing has those singularities. Said another way, maybe yet another way, all the singularities of an amplitude, that is to say all the places it can become infinity, 
at those points, it must break into lower point amplitudes. Physically, where does this come from? It comes from the very intuitive picture where the thing is merging, it's producing a particle which is traveling a great distance in space-time. So this is literally it traveling like all the way to Alpha Centauri before decaying. Okay, and the poles and propagators inside Feynman diagrams are just that long time traversal. Okay, you can see that super explicitly in Schringer time parameterization, but, but that's what it is. Okay, so these poles have physical meaning and they're coming precisely from that exchange. Okay, there's, uh, uh, we're gonna elaborate on that at length, but basically this is what lets us connect higher point to lower point. So the big roadmap is we're gonna fix all the lower point using basic things like Lorentz invariance, exchange, and so on, and maybe already the first miracle is that everything's fixed. Yeah. Then we use factorization to fix everything above three point, four point, five point, and so on. Okay. And um, we'll do that in a, a number of ways. Okay, cool. Any questions? What's that? Oh, that was G Newton. So the gravitational constant, yeah. So the one on uh, eight pi g sitting in front of the einstein hubbard action, that's that g, g Newton, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right, that's right. <clears throat> cool, any other questions? All right, so uh, let's, uh, let's dive into scalars. Okay, let's start really simply, especially since we have the uh, kind of on-ramp uh, for, it's three, okay, I have, I have 30 minutes, right? Yeah, 30 minutes, yeah, cool. Yeah. So let's start with scalars, uh, where we'll learn or relearn some things. We're gonna try to crawl before we walk, okay? Uh, scalars is very easy, because there's very few invariants you can write down. Okay, so let's start with scalar theories. Scalar theories. Okay, and we're already encountered some things that uh, will either seem obvious to you or wrong, <laughs> but or just intuitive and correct. So, what's the three-particle amplitude? Okay, so let's start easy. A three. What could it be? The idea of a bootstrap is it says take all your invariants, which are in this case uh, we have we have uh, uh, we just have a scalar, so we can write whatever it is in terms of momenta. P1, P2, P3, and then write down some function of it. But as I just told you, okay, just to remind you, PI dot PJ, these are all related to PI squared, these are all connected and they're all zero, okay? So for, let's say, a massless uh, 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 scalar particle, PI squared is zero. Uh, these are related by what I showed you before, so every invariant is vanishing at three point. There are no invariants. Now you could say, well, what if they're massive? Then the invariant could be m squared, okay? But that's fine, it's still a constant. There's no invariants that depend on energies or momenta. All you have is numbers. Maybe that number is a mass, that's fine. But it's a number, which means that the only three particle amplitude is a number, lambda, okay? This is the only three particle amplitude of scalars that is allowed, okay? There's nothing else, some constant. <clears throat> now, why might that be confusing? Okay, well, you can now ask, what theory does this come from? Well, you can think, of course, this comes from lambda phi cubed over three factorial. Okay, that's what this interaction term is, a potential cubic term, okay? But you immediately say, wait a minute, what about all the other things I can clearly write down, which are also computing at, uh, com uh, uh, contributing a three point, okay? For instance, <clears throat> what about d phi squared times phi? Okay, so this is three phi's, so like, what, what about this one? Yeah. D, so yeah, here it is clearly, d phi quantity squared times phi. Three phi's and there's two derivatives, okay? Well, you should already be suspicious of this because that actually showed up in a previous, our previous example. But let me show you very explicitly why it, it is something that we uh, uh, somehow don't need to worry about, okay? Well, just by integrating by parts, so I'm just gonna be doing QFD here, nothing fancy. Just integrating by parts, I can write this as one half box of phi squared minus phi box phi, okay? Th th these are just literally equal to each other, okay? And um, if, you, if, you, if you look carefully at kind of what I'm doing here, I'm secretly doing that uh, p1 dot p2 manipulation, which I think has been erased. But earlier I wrote pi dot pj in terms of pi squared. That's secretly this combination in Feynman diagrams. So in other words, I'm kind of instantiating the identities I applied on the amplitude upstream in the Lagrangian, 
I'm just like preparing it in that nice state. And now you can see quite, quite explicitly that this thing depends on box phi. Okay? And if I integrate by parts here, this also has a box phi. Okay? So both of these terms depend on box phi, which is the leading term in the equation of motion. Okay? As I just said previously, in an effective field theory, when you see an equation of motion, just like box phi, you can substitute in what box phi is as long as you power count in whatever this higher dimension operator is. Okay. Now what that means is that I can now do a field redefinition that eliminates this term. Okay. In other words, you thought that this was here, but I can go to a field basis where it's literally gone. Okay. I do a field basis transformation that eliminates box phi terms at this order. Uh, and this term is gone and there's no cubic term. So in other words, this thing is spurious. It's spurious. Now, it might seem too good to be true because you'd be like, well, how did I just get rid of it? Well, you didn't get rid of it forever. You just got rid of it to the next higher point, okay? Because if you think about what box phi is, box phi equals some other stuff that's higher order in phi, you know, maybe phi squared or some other, other junk. When you plug that in, what you get is some operator that's higher than three point. Okay? So the kind of physics behind this is that even though you could write this Lagrangian term down at three point, it's secretly a four point or a higher term. Okay? You just wrote a four point vertex in a really bad way. The way that manifests in the amplitude is that this can't contribute ever to the angel amplitude. Okay? So what that means in this simple example is that you can always go to a basis with scalars where the cubic interaction is a potential term and everything else is gone. That's always true. <clears throat> uh, what's some, uh, maybe not too surprising is that this, is, uh, uh, this uh, isn't just about a single scalar. You might think, okay, single scalar, so that's a simple theory. What if I had 25 different scalars? You know, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3. Surely I can do something. So let's do that example. What invariant can I write for three completely distinguishable different bosons of different mass? Still a constant. Okay, it, it doesn't matter. These could be three mesons, different masses, different whatever, uh, but all scalars, you can still only write a constant. And that's because the same argument holds if you write down an arbitrary interaction involving uh, phi one, phi two, phi three. Okay, so um, let me not go through the exercise here, but you can do the same thing here as there. And you can write this as terms involving box of a field. Same thing. Uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of box-like box, box -like terms, but the point is you can do the same thing, and this is equally unphysical. Okay, so we learned kind of like the most baby version of a maybe slight surprise, which is there's no such thing as a cubic self-interaction other than a potential term. <coughs> there's always a field basis where you can remove it entirely. It contributes no physics, okay? That makes it very easy to go to higher point, which is my next, uh, my next uh, task. Any questions about this? Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is a different statement. Yeah. So the operation that phi cubed contains a non-linear model is much fancier, high-minded things, and it's not. It's not. It's not saying the NLSM is trivial. Uh, yeah. And it's so. So phi cubed is not trivial, and also uh, NLSM is not trivial. Uh, it is true that phi cubed is the only three-point interaction you can write down, but its relation to NLSM is much more subtle because in NLSM there is no three-point coupling also. So that was a comment that sounds connected but is unrelated to this. I can tell you, it, it's easier if I explain that separate story to you uh, to see why it's different, but it's not, it's not connected to this, no. Any questions? Okay, let's go to higher point. Okay, so the higher point, we can, uh, again, for this scalar case, okay, so that's the, all three-point amplitudes. Let's compute the four-point amplitude. The four point amplitude, we can uh, do something which is essentially, uh, th this is the workflow for anyone building amplitude order by order. By order. What can four point be? Well, like any amplitude, it depends on pieces that have singularities and pieces that don't. So what I mean by that is things that can blow up for choices of momenta and things that can't blow up. Okay, so let me give those names. So. Uh, this is, I'll call factorization a fact, and I'll call this continuous. So uh, if you like, this right now is an arbitrary function. I'm just splitting this into two parts of that arbitrary function, the one that contains poles and the one that doesn't contain poles. Okay. Of course, that split is kind of arbitrary, but it won't matter to make a split. 
And again, if it wasn't clear, everything in this story is going to be tree level. I should have mentioned, I emphasized this. Okay. Okay. Let what, what do I mean uh, precisely? So, well, a four fact, so the factorization piece by definition has poles. So let me just give those names. I'll call this n s over s plus n t over t plus n u over u. Okay. So that I just li like literally mean it has like massless poles in it. I'm just assuming that. Okay. Uh, if it didn't have massless poles, then we'd set it to zero. If it does, then we have this. Okay. So I'm, I'm inputting some notion of, of what particles are exchanged, but I haven't told you what these functions are, ns, nt, and u. Okay. Meanwhile, A4 contact, uh, it's called contact because as a statement of uh, you know, the intuition of Feynman diagrams, it looks like a contact vertex. It has no inverse momenta in it. Okay. But I'm just giving it that name. Now, clearly, the condition of factorization only constrains the piece with poles, only the piece that has singularities. This thing will never become singular, so I never get uh, a singularity that I can extract the, the residue or normalization of. So I just need to take the factorization piece, and I take A4 factorization, multiply by S, okay, and then send S to zero. Okay, this is me picking out the one on S pole in this thing and pulling off what its, its uh, residue is. And uh, this thing tells me this is minus a3 times a3. That's just this formula here. Okay, product of lower point three particle amplitudes. Now here's where lower point feeds into higher point. Let's say we chose to make this a3. Okay, so a3 is lambda. Maybe lambda is zero. Okay, if lambda is zero, then this is zero. If lambda is not zero, then it's not zero. In any case, this is minus lambda squared. Okay, which immediately tells me that ns is equal to, it tells me that the limit as s goes to zero of ns is equal to minus lambda squared. Okay, just by taking the limit. Whatever function of, the, of s and t this is, this tells me the limit as n goes to zero, this is minus lambda squared. And similarly for n, nt and nu if I go in the other channels. Okay, so if I, if I stipulate that it factorizes appropriately in all three channels, because it's the same state and they're bosons, then this is true for ns, nt, and, and u. Which then fixes, in kind of a simple way, precisely what a factorization is, is exactly, un, you know, completely expectedly what you would have gotten from Feynman rules. <coughs> okay. So we have a4 factorization, which is equal to minus lambda squared, one on s plus one on t plus one on u. Okay. Um, in this, again, in this simple version, it's not telling us anything that wasn't like super obvious through other means. But for more serious theories like higher spin theories or string theory, it can tell us super non-trivial things. Okay. But in this simple example, scalars are simple. It's not that not that impressive. Uh, now, of course, there's the last piece, which is the contact piece, and all this is is any possible function which doesn't have poles, and is symmetric in its arguments. Okay, by assumption here, I, I, I said this kind of implicitly, and I also input it here. I'm assuming the external states are the same phi. There's a single phi. There's not multiple phi's, which means that the answer should be symmetric under swapping s t and u. Okay, if I swap s t, swap t u, swap s u, these are different ways of exchanging particles, and this is manifestly symmetric under that because I've assumed that. Similarly, for the contact term, we can just write down all possible contact terms. In fact, let me do that here. And that simply classifies all possible scalar field theories. So what we're doing right now is classifying the entire space of effective field theories of scalars that could ever exist in principle. So in other words, again, this is like a baby version of like if someone came into your office and said, I have discovered a new scalar field theory of a single scalar that has amazing new symmetry, it'll do this and that, and, 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 and no one's discovered it. You know that they're wrong because we've outlined all of them, first of all. And if it's a new one, we know that it violates either Lorentz invariance, uh, uh, well, Lorentz invariance or factorization, okay? Um, uh, and and uh, we can now classify them. Okay, so what are the options? So it could be a constant, okay? We're just gonna classify them by number of momenta inside the uh, object. Of course, it could just be constant. Uh, it could go as, uh, two powers of momenta. It can't go as one power of momenta because that would be Lorentz invariant. So it has to go with an even number of momenta. For even number of momenta, the only object that's symmetric under S, T, and U is S plus T plus U, okay? This is the only thing linear in S and T and in U 
uh, which is fully permutation invariant in all three variables, and this here is zero. <clears throat> okay, this was exactly the example we've seen like multiple times. This was why that two derivative scalar theory had no four prime amplitude. But we can keep going, okay? There can be higher powers. There could be s squared plus t squared plus u squared. Okay, this is not zero. Okay, let me tell you what these are, by the way, in, in operator language. This is phi four theory. This is lambda phi four theory. This is d phi squared phi squared theory. This is d phi to the four theory. Okay, uh, again, I'm dropping the overall normalization. There's some lambda sitting in front of these, which is the Wilson coefficient, which is of course free. I'm not telling you that's fixed. It's, it's, there's an overall scaling, and it's not fixed. Now you might wonder, like, wait a minute, I thought Bootstrap's supposed to tell me everything. No, it only tells you what's fixed by principles, and the value of the phi 4 coupling is not fixed by Lorentz invariance or factorization. It's free. So there's absolutely nothing confusing in the sense that we didn't pin down the values of, uh, of uh, alpha s or alpha weak or, or whatever, or your coupling constants. Those aren't fixed. So they should enter into this as freedoms that can be freely floated. Okay, so I won't write it here, but there's a coupling in front of any one of these. Uh, the last case is uh, S cubed, I mean, we can keep going, S cubed, T cubed, plus U cubed, which is also STU, 3STU. Okay, and this is uh, uh, maybe the most studied version of these theories of the so-called Galilean theories, where they have uh, many, many derivatives. Okay. Now, in general, I should say, you could again have a point of confusion, which is, wait a minute, there's lots of ways of contracting the derivatives that I've been sloppy with. Are these derivatives on separate phi's or the same phi's, or what's going on here? Like, I, was, I didn't tell you who's contracted with who. Here's the beauty of it, it doesn't matter. Contract it any way you like, I, I don't care. You could, these could all be boxed, you could like box to the 20th, box to the, you know, box cubed, acting on one field, whatever. Whatever you get is gonna be this form plus maybe zero, okay? Maybe the coefficient of this is zero, but this is the only structure you can get. So it doesn't matter which one it is. Now, of course, we know for an offshell Lagrangians that certain Lagrangians have nice symmetries, like the Galileon, some don't. And the fact that that difference evaporates at four point just means that an understanding of that symmetry must come from higher point, not from four point. Okay, so we're only given what we assume, no more, no less. So we get the coupling constants and the structures. <clears throat> okay, good. Uh, yes. Oh, why is there no one on S squared? Good. So I implicitly assumed in my factorization assumption. Uh, oh, it's gone, okay. So when I wrote an amplitude like this, when I wrote some limit of S as S goes to zero, goes to A3, A3, indeed, there was actually an assumption here, which is that the dispersion relation for the state in between was box. That is to say, the state in between here satisfies an equation of motion that's like box phi equals zero. It's propagator, effectively, which I can do because I'm at weak coupling. So there's a notion of states, cutting them, looking on that support. You could relax this assumption. So, for instance, you can imagine there was a d squared here. Okay, you're clearly playing with fire, but this, this, can be, this can be studied. Things like conformal gravity, if you've, see, if you've seen that, it's a theory where the leading term relevant to the graviton dynamics isn't r, but r squared which is a little bit like having a leading ter kinetic term be box phi squared rather than d phi squared. You can just assume it. So whatever you want, make that assumption. We usually assume this so that we don't have ghost modes. Uh, uh, we usually assume box phi because there aren't ghost modes. When you add more derivatives, it almost universally adds ghost modes, so if you're playing with fire. But if you're not worried about unitarity as a principle, then you can do it. So people, in fact, do bootstrap in these kind of conformal gravities this way. Yeah, other question? Sorry, same. So, sorry, which coefficients aren't constant? Yes. Uh, very good, excellent. Thank you for bringing that up. Good. So you could say, wait a minute, I've been too sneaky here. This ns could be minus lambda s squared plus some function of s that vanishes when s goes to zero. What happened to that piece? Well, that piece, ns has a linear piece in s, exactly in here gives s over s, so it's the same as contact. So yes, that term exists, and that is precisely the freedom that's already absorbed into the contact terms that we write later. 
So as a general principle, that's what, what, that's what happens. Factorization fixes the numerator exactly on the support of the pole, which gives you some sloshing freedom, which, cancel, which, which would cancel the pole. But that is precisely what we call contact, because it cancels the pole. So exactly that freedom is already accounted for by the rest of the uh, form of the amplitude, which was the contact term. Oh, very good. So that's where I'm assuming in tree level polynomial in S, yes. Uh, but absolutely, if you go to loop order, which I am uh, have, well, maybe I'll touch on at some point. Uh, usually what we do at loop order is we look at integrands. So for integrands, they would have all the properties of a tree amplitude in that they're rational functions of the kinematics, and then use the same rules. If you wanted, for whatever reason, to jump all the way to the integrated answer, the loop integral, after doing the integration, then you could look at logs and just be more careful and wise about things. But it's, it's trickier, definitely trickier. Is there another question? Okay, cool, um, very good. So uh, this is all theories uh, that of a scalar, of one single interacting scalar. Now, let me return to that, uh, that, that kind of messed up example I showed you of a theory that looks rich and interacting, but was secretly free. And let's prove that it's free from the point of view of an amplitudes person. Okay, so we, we saw how to prove it from the point of view of a quantum field theorist. You would have to know that there's a field redefinition to map that theory to a free theory. Okay, but let's say we didn't know any of that. We just have functions. How would we deduce that that original theory, which let me just remind you of, is one half d phi squared g phi. That was the, that was the original theory. Let's prove that this theory has no scattering amplitudes from factorization and Lorentz invariance alone. Okay? Okay. Well, I don't get to use the Lagrangian, first of all. I don't get to use this Lagrangian. I don't get to talk about G. I only get to know one thing, which is that everything has two derivatives. Okay? The only input here is that everything goes as P squared. P squared. So the, uh, the, every interaction is a P squared. Okay? Which means that every contact term is P squared. That's all that means. That's my only input, together with Bose symmetry. Okay. Now, uh, let's, let me prove to you, at all orders uh, in, in numbers of particles, that this is a free theory. Okay. And we'll use induction. So, what's A3 for this theory? Well, we, okay, we went through this a million different ways, but uh, it's zero. Okay. That's my induction hypothesis. If you like, I know it's lambda, but in this particular theory, I have to fix the coefficient lambda, and it turns out it's fixed to zero. Okay, so that's my first step, A3 is zero. Okay, it's a constant and that constant happens to be zero. What's A4? Okay, well, A4, we just went through this. A4 has a factorization piece and a contact piece, but the factorization piece is zero because A3 is zero. There's no three-point amplitude. It can't factorize entity on anything. So the factorization piece is zero, so you only have contact. Okay? If it's only contact, that means it's one of these, uh, one of these, one of these characters. But I told you it's two derivatives, p squared, so it can only be this, s plus t plus u. We did in general, which means that a4 is also zero. <clears throat> okay. Now we keep going, okay? So we go to a5. a5 also has pieces that have factorizations, and they call it a5 factorization, and then a5 contact. Okay, and mo more generally, an equals an uh, factorization plus an contact. Let's look at A5 factorization. This needs to factorize onto A3 or A4, but they're both zero. Okay, so you can probably get the idea here. This is now zero. Okay. So we're only left with a contact term that involves five particles. Okay, as it turns out, the contact term involving n particles has to be involve two derivatives, so a P1 and a P2, a PI and a PJ, and it has to be perm invariant. And the only object is PI dot PJ summed on NJ. Okay, which you can show at end point is, again, vanishing. Okay, so uh, these objects are zero by the underlying perm invariance. So th the idea here is that the way a, a, an amplitude person shows this is zero is they keep showing that nothing has factorization channels, and at each point the contact term is trivial, and they induct all the way to infinity. Okay, so another way of saying this is the triviality of this theory follows from a more pristine way of saying this has no scattering, which is that in any amplitude with two derivatives, two derivative accounting on all interactions, and Bose symmetry, the S matrix is trivial at tree level. Okay. Uh, it feeds into higher loop and so on, but let me not get into that uh, quite yet. <clears throat> 
Okay, so this is the amplitude's way of actually seeing uh, how that works. Any questions? All right, let me, uh, let me now dive quickly into the yang moles uh, to the vector and tensor case. Uh, again, I, I won't fully, re well, if, if, uh, I guess it depends on how much time I have now, but uh, uh, this, this story won't finish here. We're gonna continue later. But the idea now is let's do the same thing for higher spin, spin one and spin two. Okay, so let's do vectors. <coughs> okay. We did scalars, so let's do vector theories. And um, we're gonna learn something maybe a little less trivial than, than, than for the scalar theory. Uh, but for, for reasons that I wanna be different from the other lectures you've seen, maybe normally I would start bootstrapping at this point with spinner helicity, which is the cleanest way to see this. But I kind of want to emphasize that spinner helicity is one tool in amplitude, it's one particular nice feature, but there may be a misconception that like all the magic is coming from it, when the real magic is understanding what physics to impose and that the theories are unique. So I'm actually gonna do this full analysis of vectors and tensors with polarizations, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, I had already told you that like polarizations are redundant. Polarizations have this uh, very annoying feature that they intrinsically contain redundancy. But nevertheless, we can still think about them as intermediate objects and bootstrap amplitudes made out of them, okay? So the, here's, the, here's a kind of starting process. Imagine I have momenta, p mu i, and polarizations, e mu i. And even though these would typically have some backstory in terms of a gauge theory, I wanna think of these as, um, as, as, as the following. So, so this is momentum, this is polarization, okay? And they have some conditions, p squared equals zero, transverse conditions, pi e, e equals zero, and then ei squared equals zero is a, is a choice I'm making to work in kind of a holicity basis. Okay, this is, that, this is actually merely convenience. But the idea is, let's say someone just handed you these Mandel stems as kind of abstract objects and said build functions out of these objects that make sense. Okay. Now, intrinsic to this is the understanding that EI can go to alpha PI under that ward identity we talked about previously. And whatever you write down should be invariant under this, okay? So if you like, uh, I, I'm kind of living halfway between worlds. The idea is let's write down functions of polarizations and momenta that satisfy this ward identity and see what comes out, okay? And uh, we're gonna learn something kind of amusing about uh, uh, vectors and tensors, and in fact, they're kind of deeper connections. Now, this, this, uh, this uh, procedure, you have to do it with care, because you have to make sure that you're on shell at every given step. These are on shell conditions, which you could imagine you've imposed, but uh, there's a really important notion that's used uh, throughout uh, amplitudes, which is something called a minimal kinematic basis, which I need to introduce. Kinematic basis, okay, and it's the following, okay? Now, let's say I gave you P1, P2, P3, all the way to Pn, all the momenta, and I just treated them all as arbitrary, like, objects. Well, you know that since momentum sum to zero, right, sum on I, Pi equals zero, that if you choose P1 to Pn in some way that doesn't preserve momentum conservation, you'll get something inconsistent. Okay. The idea of a minimal kinematic basis is to kind of eliminate everything from your problem to enforce the onshell conditions so that the things in that basis can be freely moved while maintaining on shellness everywhere. Okay, so the idea is let's, let's, let's fix momentum conservation and these conditions kind of at the onset so that the variables we use have them automatically built in. Okay. Spinner helicity automatically does that as, as I think has been commented on previously, but we can do the same thing for uh, Mandel stems. Okay, so uh, let me tell you what I mean. So let's consider a three particle, three particle scattering. Okay, so for three particle scattering, nominally I would make uh, any invariant out of pi dot pj, ei dot ej, and pi dot ej, okay? Where ij run from one to three, one, two, three. But we know that we have constraints on this space. I, these are not all independent, okay? So obviously the first thing we can do is take one of the momenta and eliminate with momentum conservation. So in other words, anything with a p3 or P1 or P2, make a choice, we can eliminate with respect to the other two, okay? So in other words, I can chuck anything with, let's say, P3. So let's eliminate P3, eliminate P3 by momentum conservation, 
Okay, so that's one thing you can do. Just don't write anything down that has P3 in it. Okay, uh, uh, what, what does that leave me with? So nothing with P3. Uh, I can't do anything with the polarizations. Let me call these E actually, E, yeah. This would be E1, E2, E2, E3, E3, E1, okay. The polarizations are just what they are. They're, they're if you like, generic vectors from this point of view. As long as I don't include E1 squared, E2 squared, E3 squared by this implicit assumption. And then I just write down all possible p, e, p dot e type factors, okay? Anything with p dot p we know is zero, okay? p dot p is zero for all the reasons I said just previously. And the only le invariants left are the following. So let me write them down, one, three, two, one. Okay, so the kind of key point here is p3 is gone. So there's never a p3 here because I can eliminate p3 for p1. And on top of that, I've actually used uh, uh, another on shell condition because I know that p, uh, p, p, p1, p1 e1 equals p2 e2 equals p3 e3. Okay, so in other words, uh, this uh, uh, p3 e3 equals zero implies that if p1 dots into e3, I could switch it to minus, I could switch it to minus p2 with impunity because p1 plus p2 vanishes when hitting e3. Okay. So the point here is I've, I've kind of imposed these uh, on shell conditions by hand to eliminate all the redundant invariants and just be left with all the invariants that are actual phys actually physical. The upshot is that any function I make out of these things stays on the on shell surface, maintains momentum conservation and on shell conditions. That's the purpose of this basis. We can do the same thing at four point, but let me not write it down. Uh, this is maybe the, the last thing I'll say before I uh, adjourn, is let's see what this says about three particle vector scattering. Okay, And uh, this is again, it's a relatively simple exercise that's certainly been studied in the past. We can take um, uh, an arbitrary ansatz of these invariants. Okay, so what, what do I want precisely? So we want to write down an amplitude that depends on vectors. So it should be linear in E1, linear in E2, linear in E3, okay? Those, those, those linearized polarizations represent weak field vector uh, uh, normalization. So that's why they sit there. So we want to write something that uh, is proportional to E1, E2, E3 with, with indices contracted in some way with something that depends on momenta. Let's consider, so, so time, times some power of momenta, okay? We, 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 don't, we don't know, different momenta here. Now as usual, we need to classify this by the number of momenta. Uh, P to the zero, so no momenta, if this was P to the zero, there's no object because each of these has a vector index and three vectors can't be contracted in a Lorentz invariant way in four dimensions. So I know that I must have at least one power of P. So let's consider the case where A3 is order P to the one. Okay, so one power of p. As, as I've said in the past, that one power of p also fixes the dimensionality of the coupling. So when I say p to the one, I'm secretly saying the coupling constant has some dimension, uh, which is fine. And then we write down an arbitrary ansatz, like literally an ansatz, made of these functions. Okay, by ansatz, I mean just like a function of these variables, uh, which is linear in E1, E2, E3, and there's only uh, a relatively restricted form for that. Let me write down what it is. E1, E3, P1, E2, plus C2, E1, E2, P1, E3. And then one last term, C3, E2, E3, P2, E1. Okay, these are the only objects I can make. Uh, uh, why? Because it has to have a single E1, a single E2, and a single E3, and one factor of P. Okay, so this, you can see by exhaustion, this is the only thing you can have. These coefficients C1, C2, C3 are arbitrary, at least a priori, okay? But now we use the fact that we've taken this uh, kind of halfway perspective where we still want this thing to satisfy the ward identity. And we impose as a constraint, we impose as a constraint that when A3 has its polarization E1 sent to P1, or A3, with E2 gets sent to P2, or when e A3 with E3 gets sent to P3, this all equals zero. Uh, 
Okay, so what that means is you just go in here and set these E1s to P1 by the usual word identity. Okay, for many terms you'll get P1.P2, which is zero. Okay, PI.PJ is zero. For many other ones, you have to rewrite it in this minimal basis. So again, uh, I encourage you to just try this. Uh, maybe it's gone. But it, if you're working in the minimal basis, um, you always have to keep going back to it. So when you plug in these things, you'll get new objects. You have to go back to the minimal basis. And what you find is that all these coefficients are fixed. <coughs> okay. So in fact, you find that C1, C2, C3, so, so C1, C2, C3 has to be proportional to 1, minus 1, and minus 1. Okay, so there's some free overall coefficient that isn't fixed. Obvi uh, that's obvious. If I multiply this whole thing by 7 or minus 20, it wouldn't matter for the word identity. I can, that normalization is just not fixed. But the relative coefficients are 1 to minus 1 to minus 1. Okay. Now, uh, what is that object? Okay, this is the thing I'll finish with here. So th that object, <laughs> it's some product of E's and P's. Some product of E's and P's. In fact, we'll write it uh, the following way. So it turns out E3 is up to some normalization constant. I can write it as E1, E2 times P1, E3 minus P2, E3 plus cyclic. And by cyclic, I mean the other two cyclic uh, permutations of this thing. So just clock 1, 2, 3 to 2, 3, 1, and then 3, 1, 2. Okay, and this is the answer. Okay, it's this nice object plus cyclic. Now, the problem with this is that it's inconsistent. <laughs> Why is it inconsistent? So it's inconsistent, you'll notice, uh, because it's anti-symmetric in swapping 1 and 2. Okay, so let's swap 1 and 2. You swap 1 and 2, e1.e2 .E is the same, e2.e1 .E is the same. But the swapping of 1 and 2 gives you a minus sign. Okay? So in other words, if I swap 1 and 2, I get an overall minus sign. But these were vectors, vectors are bosons which means that this is inconsistent. So the only way it can make sense is if the prefactor is zero. And that is true. There is no three-particle amplitude. So there is no three-particle amplitude of the same vector interacting. This simply doesn't exist. Okay? Now, of course, you may think, wait a minute. That can't be. We know of an example. Yang-Mills theory, gauge theory, gluons. What's happening here? Well, the point is this setup had one vector, a single vector, which is indistinguishable from itself. So you should really think of it as a photon. It's one single species of photon. And what this tells us is three photons can't interact, which is also known as Fourier's theorem. Okay, so we've derived Fourier's theorem in a roundabout way. To evade Fourier's theorem, what you do is, well, you can't evade it if you have one photon, is you add many photons and you call them gluons, okay? And in doing so, you allow for an interesting caveat, which is to allow for this anti-symmetry. In particular, that caveat is that the coupling constant can have symmetry or anti-symmetry properties. So let, let me, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, let me instead consider A3 for some theory that doesn't just have kinematic labels, but also has a label A1, A2, A3. Okay, so A1, A2, A3 is gonna label multiple species of this vector, many photons if you like. It has uh, some normalization, which is F, A1, A2, A3, and I'm using, of course, that symbol on purpose, F A1, A2, A3, times E1, E2, you know, all this junk, P1, E3 minus P2, E3, plus cyclic. Okay, exactly the same expression, except I put this, like, coupling matrix, coupling tensor in front. Now, why does this simple move change anything? Well, if I swap one and two, the kinematic part is anti-symmetric, but if I also choose it so that A1, A2 in the coupling is also anti-symmetric, so in other words, if I swap A2, A1 here, in fact, if I make it fully anti-symmetric, then all is good, because it means if you swap both the kinematic label and the internal color label, because of these are, of course, colors of gluons, then everything is well, is all good, okay? So if you like, this is the onshore way of understanding why structure constants are anti-symmetric. Usually, you're just kind of spoon-fed that. Someone says the words gauge theory or fiber bundle and then throws it at you, but it couldn't have been a different way. The only way to couple three vectors together is if those three vectors are labeled in some distinct way, which we'll call gluons, and their coupling constant is precisely the structure constant. Um, very good. Uh, maybe, let me stop, let me, let me uh, well, let me tell you what we'll do next and then stop. What we're gonna do next is ratchet up that power of P. 
higher and higher, and then we're going to go to tensors. And the kind of upshot that will be slightly close to non-trivial in the story is that we're going to learn the first version of the double copy at this level. We're going to see a very striking matching between things in the tensor theory and things in the vector theory, which will, as it turns out, persist to arbitrarily uh, high orders and numbers of particles. But let me, let me pause there. Yeah. Thanks. If the, sorry, if the structure constant is anti-symmetric, then the kinematics is manifestly anti-symmetric, which means that if I swap the uh, in, internal index and the momentum index, it is symmetric. So the purpose of the anti-symmetric structure constant is to maintain both symmetry. Without it, you would need a vector that's anti-symmetric in its uh, exchange properties, which is inconsistent. So the overall scaling you won't get from here. And in fact, even its values you won't fix from here. And we can argue like from first principles why that might be. Let's say I could tell you what FABC is, like what FA1A2A3 is. It would be like me saying, I deduce that only SUN is consistent. Like it would be like saying all the other gauge groups are inconsistent or wrong. We know from the point of the gauge theory that this is almost just an input. It could be anything, uh, anything which ultimately will satisfy Jacobi. Jacobi is the one non-trivial constraint we'll see, and we'll get that from four point, actually, in the next lecture. Yeah. No. Yeah. Right, so here I'm appealing through this kind of half measure of uh, I, I, I'm not, I'm, since I'm not doing spinner helicity and I haven't, I haven't derived the relationship between spin and the kinematic structures, I'm using as input the fact that when we write down an amplitude where the linearized uh, wave functions are, you know, a polarization e to the ipx, that each one comes with a, some plane wave state of a vector which is labeled by polarization. So I use that. And the multilinearity in the external states. When we go to gravity, I'll do the same thing, except this will be a, a tensor, a tensor polarization. So I'm just using that as input. That this is, uh, if you like, a solution to linearized plane waves that are interacting in, in the bulk. Um, but reasonably, if you wanted to be completely unmoored from any question about QFT, like any of that machinery, and just think about functions, we should use spin helicity, which is what I'll also do next, next lecture. Oh, okay. Is it is it now or? Oh, when is it? Oh, it's at four. Uh, sorry, it's four thirty. So it's like an hour from now. Uh, cool. I'll just stand there. I just I'm just but part of the wallpaper. <laughs>